I've heard people say in a reassuring manner, I'm not trying to change your mind. Personally, if you truly believe that what you have to say is important, you've disgraced it by saying that. There's certainly poor ways to try and change other people's minds, but at the same time, if what we have to say matters, changing minds is exactly what we should be doing. And if we truly want what's best, and we consider ourselves capable of being wrong about what's best, then we should welcome the efforts of others to change our mind. Sure, you might not have time because this is the 12th time this week your coworkers tried to change your mind at the water cooler, but we should shoot for this in principle. So, what actually changed people's minds? Earlier we covered the fact that people mainly go off their intuition, and then our analytical minds attempt to explain why our view makes sense. If that's the case, then arguing with people won't be as effective at swaying them to our moral beliefs as we imagine it will. As Jonathan Haidt says, moral reasons are the tail wagged by the intuitive dog. A dog's tail wags to communicate. You can't make a dog happy by forcibly wagging its tail, and you can't change people's minds by utterly refuting their arguments. The most effective way to change people's minds Friendship. When people genuinely like you, the relationship keeps them from fearing your views nearly as much. It's as though their intuition says, I know you won't, damaging anything, you won't damage anything inside my belief system, so I'll let you come in and interact a little. Height says, the main way that we ch that people change, sorry, the main way that we change our minds on moral issues is by interacting with other people. We are terrible at seeking evidence that challenges our own beliefs, but other people do us this favor, <laughs> just as we are quite good at finding errors in other people's beliefs. When discussions are hostile, the odds of change are slight. The intuition leans away from the opponent, and the analytical mind works frantically to rebut the opponent's charges. But if there is affection, admiration, or a desire to please the other person, then the intuition leans towards that person, and the analytical mind will actually try to find the truth in what they're saying. The intuition is easily steered by the mere presence of friendly minds, or by good arguments given to it by the analytical part of those friendly minds. As President Theodore Roosevelt said, people don't care how much you know till they know how much you care. Another way we change our minds is with time. Almost everyone in Height's moral studies held to their initial intuitions about what was right and wrong. But given some time to think it over, some people would conform their view to evidence and reasoning that had been presented. Height notes, the delay allowed the analytical mind to think for itself and to decide upon a judgment that was contrary to the intuition's initial inclination. In other words, under normal circumstances, the analytical mind takes its cue from the intuition just as a lawyer takes instructions from a client. But if you force the two to sit around and chat for a few minutes, the intuitive subconscious actually opens up to advice from the analytical mind and arguments from outside sources. Intuitions come first, and under normal circumstances, they cause us to engage in socially strategic reasoning, rationalization. But there are ways to make the relationship between the intuitive and analytical mind more of a two-way street. While time can allow us to mull over arguments that others have made, we also change our minds because we repeatedly encounter a challenging experience, and eventually it becomes impossible to ignore due to cognitive dissonance, which forces us to change what we believe about what is possible in the world. This is the least pleasant way to have our minds changed, but when we do learn this way, it sticks with us. If you want to change people's minds, what you don't want to do is make people feel threatened. Height tells the story of his wife complaining about something he had done, and he described his internal experience by saying, even before I knew why she was criticizing me, I knew I disagreed with her. He also noted, if you ask people to believe something that violates their intuitions, they will devote their effort to finding an escape hatch, any reason to doubt your argument or conclusion. They will almost always succeed.
When I was in high school, I spent a lot of time on the internet debating with people, trying to convince them to be Christians. Let me tell you, I won a ton of converts. Okay, actually, nobody converted in all my Christian internet debates, and many of them seemed less interested in Christianity after talking to me. Surprisingly, I kept at it for a long time, even after I got no results. I think the major reason was I never asked if what I was doing was effective, only how best to say that my viewpoint was correct. Something I've noticed that we forget to ask is if what we are doing is actually working. We'll do the same tried and untrue tactics over and over, telling people how irrational we think their views are and why, yet we won't pause to ask if maybe something needs to change in how we interact. This is a surefire sign that we're not actually trying to do good at all. It might be the dopamine release, it might be good old-fashioned egotistical pride, but there's nothing loving, wise, or righteous about persisting in futility. If you claim to be trying to do good, and the way you are going about it is accomplishing the opposite of that, then you'd better stop, rethink, and try something new. This is why I particularly dislike political bumper stickers, because all they do is push people who disagree away and make people who agree more full of themselves and thus less convincing. So, based on everything I've presented here today, what do I mean when I say bridging the gap? As Sun Tzu said, it is twice as valuable to convert the enemy rather than to just conquer. What I believe can and should happen is that the two political enemies, liberals and conservatives, can convert each other. I don't think they'll ever agree on everything, nor even that they should. But I think both have some important things to teach each other that the other side will have a difficult time learning on their own. Acknowledging that is the best way to keep both sides from going too far. For those conservatives here concerned about how many young people today are left or even far left, I believe we've given them the worst possible chance to hear the right out and very good reasons to be afraid of the right. And I think if we championed them sincerely and their concerns for things like social justice and nature, even if they say bits and pieces we disagree with, we might find them a little more willing to listen to us. Heck, we might even learn something. We are often propagating the narrative that the political sides have to be enemies, if not explicitly, then by our negative reactions to any words we consider liberal buzzwords. I think it's possible to end the hostility, but somebody has to make the first move. Sure, there will always be people who are truly closed-minded on both sides, and people who will set bad examples but I believe reaching people where they are at with sincerity can be stronger than the lies and stereotypes. In a country we believe is or should be ruled by we the people, the only real change has to start first with changing people's minds. This is not a battle for political offices or laws because our culture is supposed to decide who's in these positions and what laws are in effect and take a stand if they are prevented from doing that. This is a battle for culture, for the hearts of everyday people. Either side can make the first move. So enough of that, let's discuss some practical strategies. One, you can be wrong, so live like that's true. One of the most important things I've ever learned is that while I don't believe truth is subjective, I do believe it is very complicated. Here's an example. I'm up, on a space, I'm up in a space station above Earth, and I'm looking out a window, and I can see the continent of Africa. I hold up a piece of paper to the window, and I can see it shining through, and I take a pen, and I trace Africa on the paper. And I could show it to you and say, is this Australia? And you'd, no, and I'd say, it's Africa. And you go, yeah. But then, so we would say this is a true map of Africa, it's accurate, it's correct. But then I go down to the ocean, and I'm in a boat on the shores, and I look at the shore and I go, 
Well, there's a huge bay over there. It's not on my map, so I erase part of it. I draw it in. Oh, there's a huge river. Okay, I draw this river. And I go, okay, now it's true, right? It's a true map. And then I go on the shore, and I'm like, well, there's a little stream of water. Okay, let's try and fit that on here. And the, my point is, is that there is a real objective truth about what Africa is, how it changes, how it's shaped, but at the same time, it's infinitely complicated. There's always more to learn. It doesn't mean maps are useless or that they can be true or false, but there's always more going on. One other example is nutrition. When I was a kid, I was taught about healthy foods. So I would you know, pick a healthy food and then I would eat a lot of that. But as most of you know, it's not actually healthy to just eat a bunch of carrots. So then I learned about the food pyramid and I went, oh great. So I eat a little of this, a little of that, a little of this. Um, but then I found out that white bread and McDonald's salads are not actually good quality food. Okay, so there's healthy foods, there's this food pyramid thing, and now there's, you know, quality of food. Well, the thing is, is that most subjects we study are like that. They have this depth to them, and it's not that there's no truth. I don't want to sound like that, but it's so complicated that it's, it's, it's not simple. <laughs> if things that are as simple as a map or as everyday as eating healthy can be complicated, how much more complicated are subjects like history and politics trying to map the influences, motives, consequences, and side effects of decisions involving large and diverse groups of people. As a psychologist, just one person is enough to fill a lifetime of books. We can act as though moral and political issues are obvious and common sense, but I think the, the postmodern philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre made a good point when he said, everything has been figured out except how to live. There's an incredibly important attitude of intellectual humility we must have, not just in politics, but in everything, based off the complexity of being humans seeking the truth. The modern Zen Buddhist Shunryu Suzuki talks about what he calls the beginner's mind. He says that in the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities, but in the experts, there are few. He proposes that viewing everything we do as if it was the first time is a helpful way to overcome our mind's tendency to limit what we will consider is possible. As Aristotle said, it is the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. The 18th century French philosopher Voltaire said, uncertainty is an uncomfortable position, but certainty is an absurd one. What I've found is that when we don't think like this, we often are more interested in beliefs that make us feel comfortable than in knowing what is true. Worse, we derive oversimplified moral priorities that Jordan Peterson calls ideologies. They usually contain some truth, but oversimplify situations to the point that technically they're a lie. And usually they are quite dangerous and blinding. A good sign that you've got an ideology a moral value that you've turned into a comforting idol is that you start trying to fulfill that value at all costs. You start compromising on other values you have or should have. Peterson offers solutions, offers a solution to oversimplified moral statements by encouraging stories. And not only that, but contrasting stories. In one of his lectures, he points out that environmentalists propose narratives like those in the movies Avatar, Fern Gully, Dances with Wolves. Man encounters nature, engages with it, tries to work with it, and ends up destroying it. Peterson then points to the narrative of Star Trek. Man encounters nature, engages with it, tries to work with it, and makes something even more beautiful. The point Peterson makes is that both these stories, in a sense, are true but the reality they describe is complicated. So hearing both stories ends up being far better for our moral development than a simple rule about boldness or caution, which easily turn into ideologies. Even if you know some truths, you need the help of other people to have a holistic picture of life and any part of it. 
Author Ralph Waldo Emerson said, Nature arms each man with some faculty which enables him to do easily some feat impossible to any other. Personality psychology and studies of the diverse people differences that exist show this to be accurate. Even the philosophy of the church body in the letters of Paul presents schism, which is splitting up into groups, as a problem just like heresy, which is untrue teaching as the very act of splitting up into groups hurts the Christian faith, whereas when people who are different accept each other as equally valuable parts of a whole, they balance each other and result in a functional group, not unlike Jordan Peterson's two contrasting stories of humans and nature. We see a similar model in the courtroom, where instead of hunting for unbiased people, which really don't exist, we present two incredibly biased sides, the prosecution and the defense, who do their best to find every possible argument for their case, and then a separate group, the jury, makes the final decision. Even General Sun Tzu notes that where you overstrengthen your army, you weaken it elsewhere. We have to realize that we all have different strengths, and those different strengths are incredibly important. Even with politics, it seems that God gives different people different sensitivities, and those concerns combined can produce policies that are the most helpful in protecting the well-being of humanity and all that exists. Some see the importance of protecting animals, others the value of government separation, others the value of respectful speech, and others the differences in cultural experience across the nation and the world. Confucius said, everything has its beauty, but not everyone sees it. Daniel Kahneman did several studies on averaging out the estimates of groups of people. In one study, he asked people to guess the number of marbles in a jar. He found that when many judgments are averaged, the average tended to be quite accurate. However, the magic of error reduction works well only when the observations are independent and their errors uncorrelated. If the observers share a bias, such as hearing someone else's guess, the aggregation of judgments will not reduce it. The last part of this quote adds on an incredibly important clarification. When people share the same bias, their group effort will not overcome it. I would argue it dangerously reinforces it. Thus, the pockets of people based on political view or even based on theology or race stagnate the ability for a person to truly understand what is happening and what is important. No matter the political perspective, we are all just as susceptible to out of sight, out of mind. I've witnessed the left often claiming how horrible it is that the injustice they see are sometimes glossed over, but they're often equally ignorant of far worse violations of their values outside of the US. And it's particularly strange seeing these same people upset with Donald Trump's America First philosophy. The right is often unaware of abuses like the ones in Ecuador, and when they hear this information from the left, they write off things like fair trade as liberal buzzwords, when the is issue is actually a hideous violation of human liberty. If we can all be biased by out of sight, out of mind, then we need to be open enough to let each other put things in front of our sight and thus in front of our mind. We need to view the other political side as someone whose help we need to make our own views more sober-minded. We should view the opposite political sides, especially where we can find them willing to be friends with us, as people who can help pull us out of our ideologies and people who will help maximize our ability to teach everyone. I think the best way to sum it up is with the analogy of changing a tire. If you tighten a single nut or side of the tire first, rather than alternating across the tire, you risk a tire that is not actually secure and could send your society, or I mean car, careening off a cliff. We need to build our political strategies as including the value of the other side rather than opposing them with hopes that they will find our values less difficult. German statesman Johann Wolfgang von Goethe said, Treat people as if they were what they ought to be, and you help them to become what they are capable of being. 
If we ought to be listening to and learning from each other, treat people as if that's plausible. As a practical example, many conservatives here in Washington state want to promote a new state in the US called Liberty. I spent a lot of time mulling it over after my stages of questioning the politics of everyone, and I've decided I agree that it's very wise to focus government to a more local community than keeping it at a large scale, especially here in eastern Washington. The most important recommendation I could give to the proponents of this new state is that if there will always be people with left-leaning, openness personalities in any culture, or at least in any healthy culture, then you have to make it clear that they have a place in the state. Any supporters of the state of liberty need to make it clear that those concerned with issues of social justice and the environment will not be talked down to or kicked out, but will be championed as a necessary part of the state, even if we do disagree on the best way to go about some of those issues. Slide three is, rule three is listen. When I was in Bible college, my English professor, Damani Pothan, was one of the most influential people in my theology, philosophy, and any sort of character I might have, because she taught me to listen. She would have us reread every single assignment several times, and she made sure we put serious effort into finding what the author wanted to say before we ever allowed ourselves to add in our own thoughts. That comes after. She knew her class was full of conservative Christian students, so she had us read Obama's State of the Union address to make sure we could listen even when we disagreed. If conservatives want freedom of speech to be truly valued at the greatest possible level, that's how you do it. Dale Carnegie, author of the classic How to Win Friends and Influence People, offers a variety of rules all stating to do very similar to what I was taught in my English classes. Carnegie says to be a good listener and encourage others to talk about themselves, to give honest and sincere appreciation, to become genuinely interested in other people, and to make other people feel important with sincerity. The sincerity part is one of the main reasons I dove so deep into psychology at the beginning of my talk, because I didn't want to encourage anyone patronizing people. A counseling lecture I heard years back proposed three levels of encountering new people. The first level of encountering a new person is our most immature, where we think that person will be exactly like us. As we encounter more people, we realize this isn't true, but our intuitive subconscious then tries to make types of people. So for example, there may be men and women, but men will always be one way and women will always be another. However, true maturity happens when we can encounter new people with the mindset that, in some way, this new person will challenge our beliefs about human beings with something we've never experienced before. I've used a lot of labels in this talk, and I don't think labels are bad because they're part of language, but I do think we have to remember to take them very lightly. Always prioritize listening above labels. This leads me to a specific version of the listening problem, which I call assuming motives. I've seen the right do it when they assume those in support of welfare are entitled, rather than trying to be compassionate on others. I've seen the left do it when they assume those who are pro-life are craving telling women what to do with their bodies, rather than trying to preserve human life. You don't know what's going on in other people's heads without listening. And even sometimes after you listen, you may find that the person might be confused about their own motives. Either way, maintain a beginner's mind and keep listening. Sometimes we won't even let our own views be nuanced, having to be all or nothing with candidates. I wish I saw more of the people who voted for Trump also able to criticize him without feeling threatened. Craft your explanations and arguments so that they will reach the other person, not satisfy you. While we should listen to others because it's a loving practice, and also because we might learn something, there's a bonus for us in that we can actually craft what we say to the other person's desires. Dale Carnegie says to try honestly to see things from the other person's point of view and to be sympathetic with the other person's ideas and desires. 
Often we appeal to our own existing experiences and priorities, but I think our common values mean we can make more effective points by explaining our desires in terms of the other person's priorities and vocabulary. As we discussed earlier, people can always find a reason not to believe or investigate something. So you want to first appeal to their existing values and then offer them something new. Henry Ford said, if there is any one secret of success, it lies in the ability to get to the other person's point of view and see things from their angle as well as your own. Though I don't want left or right to think of each other as enemies, I will appeal once again to Sun Tzu's idea that the opportunity of defeating the enemy is provided by the enemy himself. When you listen sincerely and openly, you are better equipped to speak in a way that might actually convince the other person. The 19th century American poet Sidney Lanier said, if you want to be found, stand where the seeker seeks. Sadly, too often, we look down upon a person for not coming to us, even though much of the time they were never given a reason to. I will add here, if you are a Christian, this is a fundamental of the gospel. Christ gave us the opportunity in the Garden of Eden to be in relationship with him. We have broken that and continue to break it every day by living our lives in a way that revolves around ourselves as if we are God. Thus, Christ certainly did not owe it to us, but still humbled himself by becoming a human being in order to reach us. This is the meaning of humility and mercy, that rather than demanding people come to where we are at, we go to where they are. And I mean this with arguments and logic and discussion. I think both political sides will be amazed what this kind of mentality does when trying to explain our ideas to others. People don't respond well to arguments, even if they think they do. They respond to friendship, character, and respect. Monk Elder Thaddeus of Vitavnica said, our starting point is always wrong. Instead of beginning with ourselves, we always want to change others first and ourselves last. If everyone would begin first with themselves, then there would be peace all around. I think this reaches deeper than just politics, but it certainly applies here. We need to be people of character because that's what people notice. It doesn't matter how correct our views are if we are arrogant. People can feel it. I think Ernest Hemingway summed up true character when he said, there is nothing noble in being superior to your fellow man. True nobility is being superior to your former self. As a whole, I think humility is incredibly underrated. I think that's partially because it's one of the things we'd least like to do, but also because we don't know how to do it. In fact, we joke about how once you think you've got it, you don't. But we still are drawn to this trait that we seem unable to achieve. As an Eastern Orthodox Christian, we teach that humility comes from accepting humiliation. It's the same word even, humility, humiliation. But I think if we truly seek humility, we'll find the business of listening and reaching others a whole lot easier. Whereas without it, we'll ruin everything. The Greek monk St. Paisios of Mount Athos said, when we take care of everything else except our humbleness, then we never achieve anything good. Even if we did, we wouldn't be able to keep it very long. Here's, some, here's a few tips on humiliating oneself constructively. The first tip comes straight from the definitive Canadian handyman television program, The Red Green Show. They sum this tip up as, the three little words men find so hard to say, I don't know. If you haven't seen the show, it's great. Really though, we completely underestimate the power of admitting we don't know something. People notice our attempts to look good subconsciously, if not consciously. I can't tell you how many people I've seen admit, on the other hand, that they are impressed when someone concedes not knowing an answer about something. I think, the, I think the current generation really longs for this, if not the young people of all generations. We're tired of being sold things, and we long for vulnerability. If you thought admitting you don't know something was difficult, you should try admitting you were wrong. 
It's even harder, but it also shocks people a lot more, and in a good way. Dale Carnegie specifically noted, if you're wrong, admit it quickly and emphatically. We can show another person that we aren't out to glorify our own ego by criticizing not only ourselves, but our own group, or even just the version the other pe person we're talking to believes in. For example, the right can disavow white supremacists, and the left can disavow feminists who truly hate men. Two interesting things happen when you criticize your own group, and one is that people are less shocked when they encounter a bad egg in your group in the future, because you warned them about it, whereas when you get defensive about your group, they hone in on the bad eggs to disprove you. The other thing that often happens when you admit your group's failings is that the other person often responds by volunteering failings of their own side. Dale Carnegie says to talk about your own mistakes before criticizing the other person. If we don't open up to the opportunity to criticize ourselves, it's hypocrisy to think the other side should accept criticism. Okay, now that I'm done lecturing everyone on how to be humble, I want to talk about respect. Specifically, I must admit that it breaks my heart how often the right mocks the desire for respect from the left. There's definitely a point at which keeping people comfortable and never offending them can go too far, but the reality is that safe spaces can be valid for people with real traumas, and how you talk to people in general reveals how you most likely will treat them beyond talk. There's wise advice given that women should look to how a man treats his mother because that's how he will treat you. Likewise, people watch to see if a candidate speaks about people in a disrespectful way because they know the person will not likely have policies that are any better. Carnegie says simply, show respect for the other person's opinions. As I've said before, I'm not a fan of the regulation of speech by government, but that is absolutely no excuse to abuse freedom of speech. Speaking truth and speaking respectfully are not mutually exclusive. You can call something out while also talking to another person like they're a human being. Black writer Maya Angelou stated that, people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Sun Tzu said to make your position unassailable. The Bible calls this being above reproach. It doesn't mean pleasing everyone either. It means being clear, saying what needs to be said, and most of all being the caliber of person who people believe when they speak. If there's a good reason people are concerned, then the person who wants to help people, rather than stroke their own ego, will happily accommodate. If local groups are concerned about white supremacists, a wise move would be to show solidarity against them with a written and or public disavowment of such people. When I recently attended a meeting of the John Birch Society, a prominent conservative group, I was happy to hear them explicitly state that the people specifically barred from membership were those with a racist agenda. We should make allies with anyone we can find common moral ground with, but not who we can trade political favors with. On one hand, I sometimes see a spirit amongst anti-hate people, which seems a lot like hate to me. I personally would say hate is when you want to see people destroyed or treated as less than human. Sadly, people engage in what I call right makes might thinking, in which they don't have to follow the rules that they put on others because the correctness of their cause justifies their behavior, like screaming in people's faces with microphones about how they're silencing people. On the other hand, some of my heroes are people who have truly compassionate hearts to fight hatred and don't see the incorrect views of someone else as a justification to treat them as less than human. Kesha Thomas is a woman who was with a group of 300 anti-KKK protesters responding to 17 Klansmen at a rally of theirs. The protesters saw a man with an SS tattoo and a Confederate flag shirt, and they chased him down, threw him to the ground, and started beating him with sticks and kicking him. He was likely going to die. Kesha Thomas jumped from the crowd onto the man in order to protect him and keep the protesters from killing him. Hate, even if we can rationalize it, will never conquer hate. 
but will always stir up more of it. And I honestly think that's what some people on both sides want because their egos feel validated by the fight. But as Martin Luther King Jr. said, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. Kesha Thomas is an example of what it's like to truly love, to have mercy, to set an example, and to fight hate of any kind. I can only pray that if push comes to shove, I might be that humble and that courageous. All this to say, our character is incredibly important if we truly wish to reach anyone. Humility and respectful attitudes are absolutely key. The 18th century Russian monk, St. Seraphim of Sarov said, acquire the spirit of peace and a thousand around you will be saved. While he's talking about the Holy Spirit and people following Christ, I think there is application in all things. People listen when they sense character in you. They may have had bad experiences with the other side, but even just meeting a single member who will hear them out sincerely can be profoundly impactful. Black blues musician Daryl Davis, by chance encounter, ended up befriending some KKK members. And after spending time being friends with them, many of the members who admitted they'd never been with a black, friends with a black man until Daryl gave up their membership and left the clan. Daniel Kahneman speaks of a study that revealed it takes a single instance of something to make future instances less surprising to a person. I believe it also only takes one person of character for an outsider to believe there might be something valuable within a group or label. People need time. They need to go on a journey, not have things shoved in their faces. You don't respond to it any better than they do. As we talked about earlier, we ask ourselves if we have to believe when we don't want to, but can we believe when we do want to? Sadly, we don't offer this same standard to others, but rather demand that they remove all our doubt in order for us to believe them, which of course is impossible. We expect them to arrive at our view without any of the influences or sources we've had. In reality, it takes human beings time and processing to grow. Having our whole belief system flipped on its head actually makes us mentally unstable, whereas having beliefs adjusted a little at a time can make progress. Or the opposite, if the belief we're moving towards is unhealthy and untrue. There is a Chinese proverb that says, you won't help shoots grow by pulling them up higher. If we think we can use arguments and speak rudely to others and sway them, we are in for a shock or maybe a validation of our belief that everyone else is an idiot for not thinking like us. Like many other things I've said, I'm talking to both political sides right now. It is not obvious to some people that the Constitution helps prevent oppression, and it is not obvious to some people what kind of social injustices are occurring in the world. We have to allow people to be ignorant and flawed, to change one point at a time, and we should do our best to be conduits for that change. We cannot be overly critical. As Winston Churchill said, you will never reach your destination if you stop and throw stones at every dog that barks. We must let people take their time. The 7th century Christian Saint Isaac the Syrian said, a small but always persistent discipline is a great force, for a soft drop falling persistently hollows out hard rock. People are moved by what reaches their intuitions and helps create a narrative. The big implication here is that we need to craft experiences for people. This means the experience of our character, of our listening skills, but it also means telling stories that move people and let them experience things firsthand. David Hume said of man that any logic which speaks not to the affections will never engage him. I saw a short video years ago that if I could find it, I'd be showing here. <clears throat> the, de the video depicts African soldiers moving people in trucks in Africa. The people are clearly slaves and they are bundled up, but when they are unloaded from the trucks, they take their hoods and scarves off, and they are white people in brand new suburban clothes. It made me immediately and intuitively uncomfortable. And when I asked myself why, kicking in the analytical part of my brain, I realized I, used, I was used to seeing Africans in slavery. 
A social justice advocate could have tried to convince me of that same idea, but I don't think it would have stuck because it would have been too abstract for me. I'm used to seeing Africans in slavery. What, what's your point? On the other hand, I learned it on my own without any preaching, simply by watching a 30-second video. And it made me sad to realize I'm desensitized to Africans and slavery. Our character opens, up, opens people up to us in general, but stories open them up to particular issues. I remember hearing stories from some of my black friends at college about how often they were pulled over by the police with no explanation. I've been stopped twice in my life, and let's just say both times I deserved it. These stories were likely the only things that would conquer the views I was raised with and balance them out. Several friends of mine admitted they couldn't understand why conservatives were so afraid of social justice until I explained to them the culture that led to the gulags in Soviet Russia. After that, they admitted it made much more sense and it also made it clear the difference between healthy and toxic social justice, a difference that I would like to emphasize here. Humans have a need for beauty, and they need art to be beautiful. Sadly, sometimes we make art to push a belief without any attempt to make it truly beautiful, which is technically propaganda. If we're going to do that, we might as well create a book or a speech. Star Wars The Force Awakens had an antagonist who had little personality because if she had been annoying at first like Luke Skywalker until she had to grow up, people on the left might have been upset. God's Not Dead is a movie that made many evangelicals happy but likely converted no one and is honestly a poorly done movie. <laughs> Mad Max Fury Road was a movie that, without feeling preachy, powerfully displayed through quality storytelling how damaged a culture is when it mistreats women. Sadly, I don't have an example of a quality conservative movie. But we can turn to movies that exist like Avengers Infinity War to illustrate, for example, population control. And then there's excellently balanced pieces of art like Black Panther, the Marvel movie, not the group, which portrays the dangers of violent left and passive right with an excellently crafted African sci-fi world. We need to tell the stories of past massacres like the racially driven Holocaust and current sufferings like the shooting of Lavoie Finnicum. And we need to use our mediums well, be it film or music or anything else. Jonathan Haidt summarizes the views of developmental psychologists Kohlberg and Piaget by saying, if you want your kids to learn about the physical world, let them play with cups and water. Don't lecture them about the conservation of volume. And if you want your kids to learn about the social world, let them play with other kids and resolve disputes. I'm pointing here to the value of experience. The loss of the value of beauty in Western culture dates back to the Protestant Reformation and is heartbreaking in my opinion, but those high in openness can help us recover this fundamental need. Beauty is a direct path to the intuitive subconscious. Make people feel, and you bypass the need to argue. As Fyodor Dostoevsky said, beauty will save the world. The best way to help people not ever hear you is to trigger negative intuitions. We make jokes about not triggering people, but I think there's validity to the concern. We all have sensitivities and can be rubbed the wrong way by words like white privilege or patriotism or by serious traumas. There's definitely a level of caution that's too much, but it would be wise if we want to reach others to make what we want to say be digestible. Daniel Kahneman notes that psychologist Paul Rosin, an expert on disgust, Observe that a single cockroach will completely, completely wreck the appeal of a bowl of cherries, but a cherry will do nothing at all for a bowl of cockroaches. I watched a video recently of Steven Crowder confronting people for Twitter messages encouraging violence against him. And I think it's good to document people claiming to be anti-hate, but promoting hateful violence. However, Crowder would always do something antagonistic, like wearing a costume, or harassing people while at their work. 
He'd asked for an apology, but gave them the worst possible chance psychologically to do so by stirring their intuitive defensiveness, which muddled any sense his arguments might have made. Sure, the people he was interviewing probably wouldn't have apologized, but Crowder would have had far more credibility with people watching his views who might not be as conservative as he is. I know he justifies it by saying he's simply a comedian, but it still affects people because the experience is stronger than the rationalization. We should be mindful if we are muddling our own messages and shooting ourselves in the foot when, we try, when we're trying to reach others. If we want to change minds, we're looking for a sweet spot with people between leaving them apathetic and offending them, where they might be a little bit uncomfortable, but they don't completely shut down. Even if they don't agree in the moment, those little things made digestible, whether positive or negative, stay with them and add up as the person has time to mull it over and gain more experiences. Most of us get, up, get hung up on if we owe people respect, but only pride cares about such pointless legalities. I would specifically recommend not using buzzwords and catchy insults. They close others off to us entirely and offer nothing good but a cheap laugh. We can tell someone our beliefs about Hillary Clinton without calling her killery. Mockingly embracing negative terms like deplorables only makes the problems worse and makes us feel full of ourselves too. No one wants to give our views any chance when we use these words, and it didn't even make an argument to them that was in any way theoretically helpful. St. Isaac the Syrian said, while you, presume, while you presume to stir up your zeal against the sickness of others, you will have banished health from your own soul. You should rather concern yourself with your own healing. But if you wish to heal those that are sick, know that the sick have greater need of loving care than rebukes. People aren't swayed by others being defensive. On one hand, I did give the example of the right making clear statements that separate them from people like white supremacists. It's smart to make a strong, clear statement of a good thing and make it easily available. However, we want to be proactive rather than reactive and not get too hung up on these sorts of things. No one is swayed by us defending ourselves. Similarly, similarly trying to constantly defend words we are attached to and fight other words is often a waste of time. Words are subjective, and often we'd be better off, in my opinion, adopting words of the other side where we can find truth in them. Sometimes we lose a word's positive effect because someone set a bad example for it, or someone with an agenda successfully added a negative connotation. Fine, use a different word. Holding on too hard is like keeping soldiers on the field of a lost battle until the last of them are killed. If you lose a battle, you should retreat and spend your time and resources elsewhere. Don't be flexible with your conscience, but flex with everything else. As an example, and this is just my personal opinion from my experiences, I don't think there's a good reason not to try and respectfully use someone's gender pronouns. Even if you are someone that has doubts and disagreement with the current LGBT movements, it doesn't hurt to be respectful and merciful to others. If you're worried about your children seeing, explain to them why you prioritize mercy, and that will build their character far more than stubbornness. I'm not for government regulation of these sorts of things, simply for our self-regulation. I think you can be merciful and respectful to others and meet them where they are without compromising your values. General Sun Tzu notes, don't swallow bait offered by the enemy. If Sun Tzu used the internet today, he might say, don't get trolled. I think a lot of times people of all kinds intentionally antagonize the other side to make them look bad and turn people away from even listening to them. Don't fall for it. Humility, which is an acceptance of being humiliated, is a great protection against these things. So is a belief in God's sovereignty. Otherwise, we feel a sovereignty. Otherwise, we feel a dangerous need to act as though we are the arbiters of justice in the world. Focus on peace and respect so that Fox News and Huffington Post have no ammunition to use against you and the things you're passionate about. 
As I've said before, this doesn't mean not saying what you believe is true, but be sure to build it on a foundation of character. The many sincere people in the world notice your character first and your viewpoints second. Speaking the truth is in love is done by what you say, but it is measured by what the person walks away with. If you don't have character, you are actually the worst thing that has ever happened to your viewpoint. If you treat other humans like garbage, you guarantee no one will listen to you no matter how much rational sense you make. And you set a terrible example for everyone who shares your views. We need to measure our effectiveness politically, not by how good we feel we showed the other person they're an idiot, but by if they walked away closer to the truth, even if they didn't agree. Character, listening, respect, humility, and a beginner's mind are all the kinds of things that make this possible. The Orthodox elder Joseph the Hesychast said this, never seek to correct each other with anger, but only with humility and sincere love, because one temptation does not cast out another temptation. When you see anger ahead, forget about correcting for the moment. Once you see that the anger has passed, that peace has come, and that your powers of discernment are functioning properly, then you can speak beneficially. I have never seen anyone corrected through anger, but always through love, and then he will even make sacrifices. Therefore, this is how you should act. Take yourself, for example, how are you pacified, with curses or love? I'm going to wrap this up with two stories. The first I heard from Mark Herr from the Center for Self-Governance. He spoke at the six-month memorial of Lavoie Finicum, who was shot by the FBI in 2016 after the occupation of the Maller National Wildlife Refuge. Many people there at the memorial were those who saw Lavoie as a martyr of tyrannical government. Mark began his speech at the memorial by saying things like, I love the federal government. We need the federal government, etc." One man stomped out, others booed, and some rolled their eyes. But Lavoie's wife and daughter were weeping because they knew Mark was reading quotes from Lavoie. Mark told me, I realized both sides of the political spectrum did not know this man or what he actually stood for or why. They had their martyr or their terrorist. His family just wanted people, regardless of their political beliefs, to know the man they knew, loved, and missed. I realized that our culture had become fast food polarized, unable to process truth until we could squeeze our perceptions into it. This is exactly what is happening on both sides, where we claim to stand for some sort of moral value or justice, but we are, in reality, completely out of touch with anything except our own egos. Whether or not we are correct cannot be sincerely or helpfully dealt with until how we view and treat other people, the kind of character we have, is laid as the first and foremost foundation. My other story is this. At, Bible at the Bible college I attended, there was a class that was on the, was, there was a class that those on the right might consider social justice propaganda. During the class, we kept journals on each documentary we watched and each location we visited, from a recovery group for LGBT people, to a Buddhist temple, to a documentary on the racist history of Portland. I didn't want to offend the professor, but the journals didn't seem like something she would read anyways. So I took the opportunity to describe my perspectives on some of the double standards I perceived in popular social justice theories today and our class textbook. The next week, after turning in the journals, the professor noted that she was rather disappointed with the content of the class's journals, a comment that made me sink into my chair. However, she followed this with a comment to all the class that she wished people would write more like Shay, because I was actually wrestling with the content of the class. From then on, my respect for her went through the roof as she actually appreciated my challenging views. She had proved she really did value diversity more than I did. I paid attention to every concept and gave it serious consideration, the same kind of serious consideration she gave me, and I learned so 
much. If there's a chance for people to hear each other out, to hear you out, then you need to make the first move of having character, of seeking out encounters with people of different viewpoints, and of sincere listening. If you don't, I don't know if there's any chance for our country and the people of America. The views that comprise the left and the right have shifted somewhat, but these two kinds of people have existed for a long time. It's not just a phenomenon in America. I hope and pray we can find a foundation to lovingly engage each other and hear each other out, and maybe the socially passionate, the hard workers, the LGBT, the patriots, the feminists, the constitutionalists, and every other person my small view of the world can't possibly list here, maybe they can hear each other out, learn and grow, and we can have a culture that puts the dignity of human beings first and foremost.